It's pretty straightforward. If we want vicious post-traumatic stress to continue to grow in horrific exponential leaps all over the world, all we have to do is continue to model our behavior on our global culture of invalidation. But if we truly want to stop rape and sexual violence, we have to stop rape culture. My face smothers in the sand, hands tied up and behind, waves crash, gunshots and screams echo off the cliffs. The pelicans are silent. I raise my bum just a little higher. I use my desecrated body to pave the way for the rapist. Easy access to my body may keep my husband alive. If my husband knows what this rapist is doing, then he'll fight. And if he fights, he'll die. I hear my breath rasping. I hear the earth beating. I want my husband to live. Can you still hear me breathing? Are you still with me? That Sunday at 11 o'clock on a beautiful beach in St. Croix where people got shot and I was tied up and impregnated, there was no choice about what to do. The rapists had guns and they used them. But the people that love me and all of us who love others absolutely have a choice in how we respond after the events have been physically survived. Of all the terrible things that happened to me, the thing that caused the most damage was the utter denial by my family of origin. Denial of the reality of my experiences, denial of the reality of my stories, denial of the reality of living with the PTSD that I carry. And denial of their own pain, their own wounds, the scars they carry, and having their worldview shattered by the closeness to them of the violent rapes that happened to me. When you accidentally slice your hand with a cooking knife while making potato salad for friends, no one thinks it odd or T-O-O -O too much that your hand will bleed. The event may require something to mop up the floor, but that's to be expected. Why the fuck would we expect anything less after the body is desecrated through the genitals? After trust is decimated with violence? Sexual and assault and rape are as horrible as we think they are, and there is tremendously difficult healing required in order to get well. Rehab doesn't surprise us after a stroke, but long need for recovery from these kinds of crimes is another of our socially well-kept secrets. These are crimes that catalyze lifelong, multi-generational wounding, and getting well is possible, and the journey from rape to restoration is a long one. I have been at this for close to 35 years. It would have been much, much less had there been an environment of telling and listening in my family. Speaking the truth of our stories begets the truth of our stories begets the truths and validation we need in order to heal. Listening to the truth of our stories begets the truth of our stories begets the truths and validation we need in order to heal. This cyclical, reciprocal, circular series of interactive loops and the courage it takes to stay in the arena and feel the full extent of the associated feelings no matter whether they're snot running down, eyes swelling up, sweat puddling, this is what is required to put an end to rape culture. We have to be willing to bear witness. Here then is what I've learned. What makes the most damage, what drives it home, is the surrounding milieu into which we are received after the traumatic events have been lived through. And this we are all a part of. We are able to change. We are able to bear witness. Just look around. We are doing the change right here, right now, together, while each of us is also alone inside ourselves. We are taking the first step at deconstructing rape culture. Me being, being willing to speak what I know to be true, and all of you being willing to bear witness. I am here as part of Join the Conversation. We are making a documentary called Living After Rape. This film will explore with people who have lived through rape, people who have raped, and the loved ones and connected extended communities of both. Please, come talk with us, come film with us, come speak your truth with us. Whatever it is, you can find us right over there. We'll be filming all afternoon. Help us bring Living After Rape to the screen. We have to tell and we have to tell, we have to listen, and we have to listen. Tell and listen with our words, with our ears, with our eyes, with gentle hands, and ultimately, tell and listen with our hearts. 
I'd like to close here with this one last thing. <clears throat> they tell me it's my stance of opposition that renders me assailable, as if a fervent belief could engender violent crime. Is it oppositional to think that drinking my tea in my teacup, sitting at my table in my cozy home, is a kind of lying, if in order to do it, they have to pretend away my pain? Is it unholy to crave what's real? Is it a God-vowed desecration, a raping of the deity, to search for the voice that sings a song that's true? If I was a peace radical and nothing bad had happened, if I was a love advocate and nothing bad had happened, if I was an environmental researcher and nothing bad had happened, would my stance ever have come into question? They tell me it's my stance of opposition that puts me where I shouldn't be. Where I shouldn't be? Shouldn't be? Is it possible to be where we shouldn't be? Is it? Is it possible to be where I shouldn't be? How do we ever know if we're being where we should? Hindsight, they tell me, hindsight is clear. Hindsight is brilliance, one step too late in time. But living in hindsight is like seeing in a backwards. It's hard to go forward when you're only smart in reverse. They say it's my stance of opposition that renders me assailable, as if a fervent belief could engender violent crime. They say I run away from life because I refuse to pretend away my pain, as if we live to bear no scars. Thank you.